everybody! <laughs> well, thanks for your help. <laughs> Good on you. There you go. And look. There, hang on, they can still see you. <laughs> no, we'll put one out of the uh, Thank you very much for coming. And it's a delight to have you all. And uh, what a great commitment you've made on uh, Grand Final Eve to be here. Uh, now, I'm just going to say a few words of introduction for Seth. You are spread out, aren't you? <laughs> really, there's no sense of community here. Is there? <laughs> <laughs> no, as far away from one another. Don't you have any friends at all? <laughs> right, now, I'll, uh, I give a lot of talks about um, sustainability and climate change and, uh, uh, and uh, the problems of growth and so on. And I always begin those talks by asking if there's anybody who doesn't believe people are uh, changing the climate of the planet. Is there anybody who doesn't believe that? You want me to put your hand up? I wouldn't think in a crowd like this there would be anybody. <laughs> That's the problem. Nobody ever puts their hand up. Once a woman, a woman put her hand up. I was in Tasmania, in a little place called Kingston. And I said, does anybody not believe in human-induced climate change? And she put her hand up. And her name was Shirley. Give you an idea that she was in her 80s. There were no Shirley's under 80. Shirley's, like so many things in the world, are going to be extinct. <laughs> she could well have been the last Shirley. So I said, All right, Shirley, that's okay. Shirley, I'm just going to put your name up on the board. There you go, Shirley, that's it. And you're on my list of people. We should eat. First. <laughs> now, it's quite a comprehensive list. There's an immense amount of money uh, and, and power involved in denying climate change. So, you know, Rupert Murdoch is on my list, not that anybody would really like to eat him, but Gina Reinhardt is. And she'd feed, she'd feed a family of eight for a month. Clive <laughs> Palmer, Clive's on my list. He's a boy, Tony Abbott. Well, there's nothing in him. Uh, so nothing to do there. But there, and Darren. Now, you don't know Darren. Darren's my neighbour, and he's a prick. <laughs> Whether he believes in climate change or not, but when society <laughs> starts looking at one another as a source of protein, he's the top of my in fact I should move him up there. <laughs> He'll be the first to go. But when I meet people like Shirley, I've never met, met Rupert, never met Gina, never but those people, if I did meet them, I'd say, all right, well don't worry about climate change. Put that to one side. So now I ask you a question. Hands up the people who woke up this morning and thought my day won't be complete unless I see a graph. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Three. laughs> so for the rest of you, this will give you no sense of excitement or fulfillment <laughs> whatsoever. Look, we use blue. Here's a graph. <laughs> now, it's a, it's a very simple graph, and it's a very common graph. It's called, can you guess? The Bell Curve Graph, named after Tom Curve. <laughs> <laughs> the Bell Curve Graph, and it's a very hand on, I'm sorry for those people over there that might be on the seat, can't be much about that. Um, <laughs> it's a very handy graph. It's the graph of your life. You're born, you peak, you die. Okay, that's it. I'll just give you a moment to look at your life. <laughs> Uh, but it's also the graph of everything that we use that's finite. In 1857, a man named Colonel Drake drilled for oil in Pennsylvania and he struck oil, the first mechanical extraction of oil from the Earth's crust. That oil became kerosene. They distilled kerosene from that oil and the, the, the spits that they didn't use in the great American tradition, they tipped back into the rivers. Now that's part of the heritage activity in America. You <laughs> anything into a river you like there. It's a good idea. So kerosene, but then, and that thing became the means of lighting the interior of the world. Up until then, people had used oil, often whale oil. But because of kerosene lamps, we didn't have to hunt whales anymore. People stopped whaling. There were no more whaling going on except for Japan. Okay, now, but they whale for scientific reasons. <laughs> their, 
trying to work out why whales die when you harpoon them. <laughs> and the science is really very complicated. But we did have a win earlier in the year. Uh, we had an international ruling to ban whaling in the southern oceans. I mean, that's something. You know, but, but whales are smart. And all those whales in the northern oceans are going to work out that the best place to be is in the southern oceans. And Tony Abbott will be standing on the equator saying, we will decide what aquatic mammals are in the ocean and under what circumstances. And then <laughs> they'll go into detention at Waterworld in Queensland. Um, so then we had the internal combustion engine. And now we had petrol. So they were getting petrol and kerosene, but cars needed to drive on something. So another byproduct gave us asphalt. And then aeroplanes needed a different form. So we're using more. And then World War II came along, the most mechanised war in the world, and the people who lost to the people who ran out of the oil first. Then we got the two-stroke motor mower, and then the leaf blower. <laughs> Now there's a bit of a dispute, but most people think 2008 was the peak um, of oil, um, and after that it's going nowhere. I didn't look today, but it was around $1.45 or something in Melbourne. It's probably $8.32 in yeah. <laughs> The age said by 2020, uh, petrol will be $10 a litre. By 2020, not far away, 10 a litre. I want you to yell out stop when it's no longer worth driving to Marutna for a sustainability <laughs> end. <laughs> well, you're quite rich. <laughs> Most people stop about there. Carpooling people get about that far. The oil is running out. And what people don't understand is the oil is running out. Now, you can tell people that the oil is running out, but what people don't understand is the oil is running out. And oil is everything. My shirt is made from oil. The seats covering that you're sitting on made from oil. The carpet is made from oil. The ink is made from oil. We're running out of oil and we've got no plans. I mean, at least people talk about climate change, but this is not on the agenda anywhere. Oil is an enormous problem and that's going to impact everything. Food. Food will become an issue with oil uh, because of well, agriculture. A huge input of oil into fertilisers and pesticides and machinery and packaging. You know, all of those, um, all of those little things you buy in supermarkets and sell them, that's made from oil. Everything about our food is made from oil. Water, and you would know this better than most being up here, water is going to become a problem in the future as well if it's not a problem already. And of course the big problem we have is there are too many people. We don't talk about that one either. Currently there are 350 million tons of people on the planet. Three, it's a good way of measuring people because it takes the sentiment out of it. <laughs> this is how we should measure refugees to shut up all those bleeding heart uh, greedies. If, if you read in the newspaper that 9,138 kilograms of refugees arrived today, how many refugees is that? <laughs> it could be a lot. Some of them haven't eaten for weeks. And they're <laughs> Or it could just be three really fat ones from New Zealand. <laughs> so, no. So too many people. So what do we do? Well, in the first world, because we're the ones that will never give up, this country, America, we will burn every last drop of oil. We will burn every last lump of coal. We will not give up our, uh, our carbon-fueled uh, economy. But we do have solutions. What we're doing we're taking food and we're turning it into ethanol to replace oil. Great idea. Gets a tip. Because that means there's less food for people. That gets a tip because that means more people die. And that gets a tip. And people are 70% water. People to grow more food to get more ethanol and less food for people. And that's our solution. That's the bare bones reality of the whole thing. That's what we plan to do. So, basically, thank you.
These are things that aren't on the agenda. And nights like tonight are really important, and, and, and people like we have this evening who'll be speaking to you uh, are really vital in our community. There's a mountain of rubbish that's published all the time, and oh, I've got Andrew Bolt. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so the voices against what you've come here to uh, explore this evening are vast. The interests that you uh, are fighting are vast. They're political, fired by the uh, the power. Uh, and the corrupting influence of, uh, of basically the mining industry here in Australia. Gina Reinhart, now look, a lot of people make jokes about Gina because she's fat, but she's not. She's actually very thin. Just she's got so many people up her ass <laughs> <laughs> that way. So it's an, immense, it's an immense amount of power pushing back against the great and good intentions of people that understand that uh, we share the planet. We share the planet. We are only animals, we forget that. And we must remember that. We've made ourselves exceptional. We think we're smart because we, we wear clothes and we drive cars and we live in houses and we've got iPhones and we think, well, we're pretty terrific. But we are no more significant in the natural world than the ant that's strolling out the front. Oh, somebody just stood on. Well, never mind. That's the end God. We can't use that comparison anymore. So to confront these issues and to solve these issues is the challenge of today. These are, the, we've, people have known about these things for, in the case of climate change, it's been a, um, a, a slow um, blossoming of the science, but um, back, in the, uh, back in the days of the Enlightenment, somebody worked out that it was a heat trap in gas, uh, 130, 140 years ago, somebody else actually did an estimate of what doubling CO2 would mean to the temperature of the planet. And by the 1950s, well, people were getting quite strident about uh, the challenges of keeping coal uh, and oil uh, and the carbon thereof out of our atmosphere. So we face this, and it's a fight that you... Look, they're very quickly because we, we don't have a lot of time. You need a bit of history. Um, here's the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe. Now, well, you know, I think that's really where the trouble started. Uh, if we hadn't had this, you wouldn't be meeting here this evening. So we had the Big Bang and we went along about 9 billion years and the Earth formed and a billion years later water came to the planet and that gave us life, which was the invention of David Attenborough. And then we got on 12,000 years ago agriculture was invented or created or discovered. I don't know what you do with agriculture when you first fall across it. You know what is now sadly Iraq. The beginning of the civilization was in Iraq. I've got a feeling the end of civilization <laughs> may be just round the corner in Iraq as well. And then, you know, civilization went crazy. There were witches and there was superstition, but then we had the Enlightenment and that washed away the curtains of, of uh, mystery and superstition and opened the world to logic and reason. And we coasted along quite nicely until 1957 when Tony Abbott was born. <laughs> now, uh, not many of you are young, but some of you won't remember 1957, but you will remember the movie, it was called The Omen. And uh, he became Prime Minister and then an extraordinary thing happened. The arrow of time slowly started to go backwards. We got rid of the carbon tax, we got rid of the mining tax, we're going to get rid of the Clean Energy Fund, the Climate Institute's gone, we're going to get rid of all these things. We're actually back in medieval times because we've introduced knights and dames again. <laughs> and we'll just keep going right back, we'll go right back here to where life first began. We will de-evolve into single-celled organisms and God will say, try again. <laughs> through this endless, endless loop of trying again. Let's get it right now. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, um, you have the opportunity to uh, hear from three, in fact, three and a half, really, because uh, later on we're going to hear from, uh, we're going to, we're, hang on, he's over the page here, we're going to hear from Jeff Lodge, but he doesn't deserve a chair. <laughs> he doesn't deserve a chair, he's not that important. But we're going to begin with, uh, where are we? We're going to begin with Mark. Are you ready, Mark? I'm all set. Okay, can you leave the room to us? Sorry, I have to read this. I tried to commit it to memory, but the man's an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Mark teaches researchers and consults in the interdisciplinary fields of sustainable energy, energy policy, sustainable urban transport, theory of sustainability, ecological economics and practical processes by which government, business and other organisations can achieve ecological, sustainable and socially just development. Prior to joining the Institute of Environmental Studies, two for Principal Research Officer, CSIRO, Lecturer of Human Ecology, Australian National Union, Professor of Environmental Science, funding in State of the University Technology Center, <laughs> Director of the Consultation Group, and Tenure with Collaboration Consultant with Ryan Bay Broad, Hydro, Coal, Coal, Minerals and Energy, Business and Sustainable Energy. A pleased afternoon, Dr. Mark.